Well, good morning. Um, I'm just going to share my thoughts, some notes that I made, uh, just a couple, few pages of notes uh, on a podcast. It was on um, a YouTube channel called World Science Festival. It's uh, hosted by uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Brian Green. Um, he's called the moderator. He's supposed to be a physicist. And uh, participants are Rick Doblin. Uh, he is part of uh, the MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Approach to Psychedelics. Uh, and also the first person to take MDMA-assisted therapy to uh, third stage uh, critical, clinical, critical, <laughs> clinical trials. Uh, as well as uh, Gul Dolin, uh, who is a, uh, I don't know, I can't remember what he said, but uh, I believe she's an MD, uh, PhD in neuroscience. Uh, religion, philosophy. Uh, she said she chose her own, uh, designed her own uh, discipline, I guess you could say. Uh, so it opens up talking about what psychedelic, uh, where it comes from. Um, interesting, right? It was coined uh, in a letter uh, between uh, Aldous Huxley uh, and uh, a gentleman by the name of Humphrey Osmond. He was a psychiatrist who actually uh, endorsed the idea of psychedelic uh, psychotherapy, which arguably is a play on words because it goes on to say that psychedelic is mind manifest. I've always said mind revealed. Um, if I go and look at the definition uh, in Greek, it's uh, psyche, which is you know, mind. Uh, well, let's look at that then. Um, Spirit, soul, mind, right? Psyche, literally breath, a der derivative of uh, psyche, uh, to breathe, to blow, hence uh, to live, right? Um, ego, mind, soul, spirit, subconscious, uh, anima, animas. I mentioned that in the last couple of podcasts, uh, why it's related to numa breath, uh, why I relate it to prana, prajna. Um, but uh, psychedelic makes uh, the mind manifest. I don't like that translation because, again, it's not that it wasn't manifest already. It was already extant. It already existed. So I like the other two words, uh, visible or evident, right? To make the mind visible or evident. Uh, he mentions Ken Kesey, uh, new ways to think. Uh, we might be afraid more uh, of reality than of uh, uh, than anything else. Uh, more perceptions, right? It's it's talking about how uh, psychedelic assisted therapy can can allow. And I'm not talking about with therapists. I'm just saying anybody who uses it with intention and set and setting uh, can can use it uh, to modify to allow more perceptions. Uh, but as I said, this is a YouTube video. I apologize, I didn't say. Uh, YouTube video on a YouTube channel called World Science Festival. It's entitled Psychedelics, Chemicals, Consciousness, and Creativity. Uh, with Rick Doblin, like I said, of MAPS, uh, the Multidisciplinary Approach to Psychedelics, uh, Guldolin, uh, a scientist in this area, and Reggie Watts, an artist um, and a practitioner, uh, so it, it, it would seem, uh, among one of the most experienced among the, uh, the participants. All right, so uh, Rick Dobbin with uh, MAPS, uh, the first Phase 3 MDMA, uh, I'm from Belmont, Massachusetts. Uh, Gold Dolan, this is really important. Her research is into the fields of critical periods. Uh, critical periods are a point at which, uh, like uh, I've talked about this, uh, how um, kids, when they're young, they can just, you know, they got an open mind, they could absorb knowledge and information like nothing else. Uh, 
um, why kids can learn multiple languages and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, and it's harder for, for many uh, when they get older. Uh, so she was supposed to be among the first who was able to show uh, the reopening of one of these critical periods in mice. And I believe it was a reopening of a, a social, a critical social period, which opened them up to new experience and what have you. Um, and I'll relate to this to, um, I'll have to remind myself, uh, to mark down, uh, to discuss this with somebody. There's a practitioner who who uh, has a particular style. Uh, well, it's Casina practice uh, with Daniel Ingram. And uh, I'm just going to mention on his retreats, they might want to consider uh, maybe not complete disconnection, but maybe using... Uh, Gull's technology to maybe turn off uh, certain uh, interactions, right? To get that uh, social reboot of the uh, critical period, as it were. As I've said before, I personally think that um, it's not so much critical periods, it's, it's about um, fluctuating between these states, right? So I think it's not so much that the critical periods are shut off permanently, it's just that um, we've been trained and programmed and uh, um, accustomed to this this idea that, you know, this is done in this particular period of time. I mean, look at Freudian psychology. For a long time, people believe the personality was developed by the time you're seven. And it's only just in the last, what have you, number of uh, years uh, that people are starting to see that as being... Um, I don't know what you'd call it, just, uh, well, it was a limited truth, as it were. Uh, but they go on and talk about that we're currently maybe in a psychedelic renaissance, right? But psychedelics being nothing new, that nearly every culture has used, and, and I would like to recommend to these uh, um, participants the use of the term entheogens rather than psychedelics, because they go on to talk about how um, these uh, compounds or even practices like I've you can go back and listen to some of my podcasts where I talk about how uh, sweat lodges, fasting, um, uh, vision quests, uh, extended periods of meditation, uh, devoted uh, practice like bhakti and yoga, all of these can produce very similar effects. They go on to talk about holographic um, breathing techniques that were developed uh, in response to no longer having access to LSD, I believe. And so they were able to achieve these similar states of altered consciousness through altered breathing techniques. So once again, as they say later in one of the quotes from Aldous Huxley, it just highlights how thin uh, the veil is between these different states, or as the Tibetans would call it, these bardos. So they go on. Uh, I talk about how curiosity is human, or I maybe said that curiosity is humanity, to allow this connection. And so I mentioned upeka, upeksha, um, equanimity, which is at the heart of Jungian psychology. It's about the individuation process, to figure out who you are. But a big part of that is to realize that a, a huge part of who and what you are is a connection to the divine or the universal, whatever you want to call it. Um, they go on, uh, they talk about how meditation uh, is, uh, is work, uh, but psychedelics are easy, right? That's uh, Reggie's opinion. My too long didn't read, right? That's where he thinks the reason why we're having this renaissance. And uh, Gull says... Uh, Right. What drives this fascination? She says these altered states are natural. Psychedelics allow us easy access right, to these states. Um, so something like I've said in some of my podcasts over the last couple of years, um, this idea that um, these altered states come from what we would usually denote as religious. And they go on to talk about the Good Friday experiments that show that uh, somebody with training in, in theology is going to see it as a, a, a religious experience and someone without uh, 
that sort of training is going to maybe struggle for the words to explain it, but it's not going to be that same context. Um, so it's this easy access. So instead of it being open to strictly someone who will devote 6, 10, 12, 18 hours a day to this practice, it could be open to others uh, through uh, very little barrier to entry, right? Like the uh, Eleusinian, uh, Eleusinian <laughs> uh, mysteries. Uh, ancient Greek, this idea that there was a concoction they would drink to know thyself, a shortcut, uh, instead of uh, renouncing all of life and spending all day in a cave, you could take this compound to access the same insights. Um, so, uh, I'd be Go mentioned that their experiments with the mines. Rick, uh, he goes on. Uh, okay, so he mentions that he thinks this might also have to do with our our trouble with dealing with life and dealing with death. So I think what he was getting at here is. Um, Psychedelics became prominent because of a need for the the fear of death and that whole terrible experience. And what we found is studies showed that these psychedelics allowed people to have a much more peaceful transition. But what he's getting at with the rise in anxiety and depression, I think what he means is now the fascination has to do with the healing uh, that can come from the fear of death, but also the fear of life, right? So teaching us how to deal with life. Um, and he was talking about um, that there is no difference. Uh, the, the, the host uh, was talking about how um, there is this um, shamanist, uh, shamanistic culture outside of the West. And, and uh, Rick mentions that no, it's present in the West as well. We just have it kind of hidden. Kind of like the way Jung was talking about how we say we're not religious anymore, yet we go around hiding eggs um, laid out uh, by by rabbits. Uh, then they go on and talk about uh, how in 392 AD, uh, the church removed uh, the Eleusinian, El Eleusinian mysteries. Uh, and again, they make reference to my theory that uh, they weren't afraid so much of the psychedelics. They were afraid of a personal path to uh, providence, right? Um, a, a personal deity, right? Uh, even though a lot of these texts talk about a personal approach to God, uh, it still seems that many of these organized religions are more afraid of somebody... Well, and they even mention about being a, an intermediary for them, right? They want to mediate our experience. Uh, so we go on. They say, uh, how are we connected? They talk about psychedelics uh, have always been a part. Uh, they talk about the height of research being the 50s and the 60s, then it was quashed. Uh, fear of psychedelics, well, they talk about how that rose, and I think that's how they were justifying uh, quashing it as much as, you know, trying to prevent uh, the same sort of idea, an open mind, but again, you know, the average person was probably just afraid of the damage that could come. Uh, they talked about how the, the fear of psychedelics has subsided, maybe, you know, why we have an opportunity for this renaissance. I was surprised by how quickly cannabis was adopted. Uh, I really thought it would take much longer than literally overnight, um, old ladies who... You know what I mean? You never would have thought. Now they're taking it uh, instead of their uh, chamomile tea. Uh, and Dobbin talks about, uh, could psychedelics go mainstream? That's my mention of the cannabis, how mainstream it went almost nearly overnight. So I think psychedelics, in the right form, um, with the right intentions, could transform society overnight. But we'll see. So they talk about... Uh, our approach to death has changed. Uh, and he talks about how our approach to meditation has changed. Uh, I argue we haven't quite gotten to the actual practice. I've mentioned that before. But he's talking about this idea that someone who meditated used to be considered weird. I remember this because one of the very first ladies I used to have uh, 
uh, talks with about this stuff. Used to be considered very weird because she was into Siddhi Yoga, which is much more about the internal yoga at that time, uh, something that wasn't common. So we had some very cool, deep, wonderful conversations. She was really awesome, but considered super weird, right? One of my customers in, in a store, um, considered very weird by everyone else, but I knew what she was doing, so I didn't see her as weird. I, I saw her as fascinating. Now, there is a line at which sometimes this stuff can get cringy, but that's neither here nor there, right? Uh, they talk about how yoga could steal uh, your religion. That's the way I, I wrote it down. But what they mean is it might steal your uh, soul or take, take turn you into a Hindu. Um, it is true because I remember being told that uh, Kundalini was dangerous. And believe it or not, this is a hilarious little anecdote. I remember giving a tour to a gentleman visiting, um, in, in the stupa in, in the museum. Uh, he was uh, visiting from Chicago. He was a Qigong practitioner, so he practiced the uh, internal arts of, uh, of qi or, or life force energy manipulation, as it were. Um, and after the tour, we were just talking, and the gentleman himself even mentioned, because uh, I mentioned uh, Kundalini in passing, uh, because he was talking about... Um, Qi, um, what do you call it? Qi um, manipulation, but it's like Qi uh, conditioning. And so I mentioned uh, Kundalini, and I was shocked. I didn't. I just chuckled to myself. I was shocked when he said that. Oh, you know that's dangerous. Showing that he had no idea that Qi Kung itself, this practice of uh, life force manipulation conditioning is the kundalini practice it was hilarious to hear uh, but they talk about um, how six or seven lsd trips uh, would lead to permanent insanity uh, so now with our current new research we now know that of its efficacy and safety i'm not so sure uh, we've seen some evidence of uh, efficacy safety i would probably agree except for how it's used and abused. Uh, that's where I've seen, too, when I'd mentioned it before, Amanda Lemke, in her interview with Joe Rogan, mentioned she thought that psychedelics were dangerous because of how often they're abused, but the examples she gave were amongst some of the most extreme examples of both someone in crisis, mentally ill, but also of abuse. And she proceeded to say Ibogaine was, was at risk of being abused and we won't go there. And then so they go on and talk about how, uh, talking about psychedelics uh, as being a real potential medicine. Again, uh, this phase three clinical trial, one of the first, um, they were voted top 10 uh, by a science publication for the year, a top 10 uh, insights or advancements, right? This MDMA-assisted therapy, as they call it. Then the host shares his uh, one and only psychedelic experience where he had to be uh, tied, or he, he requested to be tied to the bed. He called it one of his worst experiences ever, except he proceeded to go on and say how insightful and, oh, it was really quite sad, um, which is what we're seeing a lot of. Uh, this this field of study is uh, its a bunch of poindexters uh, who, in the last few years, I've seen more and more of them have gotten experience because it's become more socially acceptable and what have you. But they just haven't had enough. You do hear Reggie Watts uh, later talk about uh, his experience. And you can hear in the way he explains his experience just the difference. Right? Someone who has one experience, they talk about their one experience. Someone who's had multiple experience, they talk about their multiple experiences. Usually your first experience is pretty ho-hum, right? Because you, you don't know how to navigate it. It's very uncommon and uncertain. Some of your best trips, experiences, are after you've gotten all of the nervousness and the trepidation out of the way. I mentioned in the previous podcast, even Reggie Watts mentioned that he was nervous the first time. Uh, considering taking some blood or acid, right? This little piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, propaganda. 
right? Uh, but, so it goes on. The host shares his really cringy experience. But I love how, um, I can't remember who mentioned it, but William James was mentioned. And I believe it was the host. He said, one special type of consciousness apart, separate from the other consciousness, separated with a flimsy veil. Was that William James? Well, I apologize. I thought that was um, Aldous Huxley. Nice. So Reggie goes on and talks about his first experience with uh, LSD. He said he was a little nervous, a little scared. He dis discussed the come up of the entheogen or the, 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 uh, the, the compound. And that's the example I'd give of someone who's taken multiple trips. Because I don't know anybody who's only taken a half dozen trips who will talk about the come up or the come down. Uh, it's someone who's tripped a lot a true psychonaut, who has really learned to appreciate that change of state. It's, it can happen very suddenly. In fact, I introduced a friend of mine to the Lemon Tech, and that's what he talks about, believe it or not. It hits hard, and it's, it's over and done with quick for him. But the thing he raves about is, is the come-up, how noticeable and how intense and quick the come up is instead of it being a slow and gradual rise, maybe with some plateaus. He says it's like a roller coaster on the way up, uh, less intense, obviously, <laughs> but it's something he talks about, and it's something that I've only seen in people who have taken a number of trips. So this train change of state—that's my verbiage. I think that's what we're talking about here. This change from what we consider our normal or our typical experience of reality, of the personal, of, of, of X, has now been flipped on its head. The example I give is it's kind of funny to hear these guys, these guys, I use the term, I apologize if it's now offensive, hear them talking about how, you know, it's cool, they get this change of uh, perception. Right? So we perceive colors in a different way, right? They're much more vibrant. And, but we never stop, just uh, I'll give an example in a minute. We never stop to think, well, wait a minute. If our, if our perception of colors are that different, that vibrant, why wouldn't our perception of experience, of reality, and therefore intuition, induction, be much more vivid, right? It is funny that they, they're they surprised and shocked by that. And because they go on and talk about how it exposes the absurdity of reality, of life, right? Um, and it's funny because Reggie talks about how they drove on psychedelics. Uh, I just wrote down lols because I got a really funny experience where I was in a car with a gentleman. We were all on acid. Um, and it was in the middle of a, just after a, a terrible blizzard, right? And so we could barely navigate the roads in this car, but uh, wow, uh, this we, we were on a, an Indian reserve and drove off the road, and uh, we actually were at such a speed, we went off the road, went through the bank on the side of the road, over the ditch, and we landed on the opposite bank of the ditch. But luckily we were on our way to a house party, so we went to the house party, we got everyone to come help us up. Uh, we picked up the car, put it back on the road, and we carried on with our night. I went to the house party, had a good time. We even went to the bar after. Because um, I'll go on and mention this later. It's this, uh, this belief that being on psychedelics, you can't create. You can't, uh, not only can you not do the everyday normal stuff, but you're not able to do something amazing or fantastic. I argue that psychedelics flips things on its head, like I said. It makes the hard things easy and the easy things hard. And in so doing, it actually makes our everyday life more clear or less fuzzy. But I'll go on here. Rick talks about his first experience with psychedelics and how they facilitate healing. Uh, Rick Doblin talks about the ego dissolves. And I say he needs to have a little chat because I say that evil do ego doesn't dissolve because it, it's a construct we attach to from moment to moment. It never really did exist. Um, 
I like ego recontextualization, but that's me. And then this is a quote that says, uh, if I could only remember my name. And so the note I made was, for me, it resonates more about forgetting to do normal things, that change of state, not just ego, right? Because in the uh, podcast, they talk about, if only I could remember my name. This is a song. Um, but I don't think it's a reference to simply getting so high that you forget your name. I think it's a reference to, like I said, when the hard gets easy and the easy gets hard, it's it's honestly like C.S. Lewis is, um, right, when, when up is down and down is up. That's when either the mind bends to fit or it can break. And, and we'll talk about that later. So then they mention LSD, uh, and that's why I mentioned uh, this belief uh, that be, not being able to do amazing things on LSD. So I would say they talk about one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I'll mention the no-hitter in baseball or my first-person shooter talent. What was crazy is I'm dyslexic, uh, right? But this was more of an eyesight thing. So this is when I first got bifocals. So playing my video game was a little bit weird because I had to hold my head in a certain way and I can only see a certain portion. So my buddy, who had a much fancier, faster computer and blah, 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 he would kick my ass. Except when I was on mushrooms. When I was on mushrooms, I tore him up. So I don't know if that was a reflex thing or if it was an eyesight thing, but I know for sure... It wasn't him letting me win because, boy, did it piss him off uh, every single time. He just couldn't help but to hate that. Um, so I think this is this this um, change of state, um, if you think about it. But we'll move on from here. Rick uh, mentions his first experience, which was in 71. He said it was uh, stressful. He said it was a struggle with potential. So that's why he continued to explore. And I've mentioned that myself. Um, for me, it wasn't so much the struggle with potential. I saw the potential. So that's what I resonate with. He said he was scared to let go. That's so true. I've seen so many like that. Right? Um, and he said, so there is enough good to keep trying. So he didn't have the greatest uh, of his first experiences, which is not uncommon uh, with some of these squares. Uh, but then the host, Green, goes on. He says, um, it comes from atoms. Uh, Fourthless science. Well, this was just showing their faithless science. I apologize. Showing the fact that um, two of the panel, uh, Green and Go, both seem to have a need to prove this in a chemical. And it's not an uncommon thing. They go and show the LSD serotonin and the psilocybin molecule. So there's another mistake uh, because we're actually influenced by the psilocin molecule, not the uh, uh, psilocybin molecule. So if we really were comparing the three, it should be psilocin, serotonin, and lysergic acid diethylamide. But, um, and then they mention you look at the molecule and know the function. That to me was a weird thing to say. Like, how can you, that's all synchronicity there, bruv. You're, that's all fiction that you're putting together. But then Gull goes on and talks about was, um, uh, she was originally interested in philosophy and she wondered if all of these things were unanswerable. Now she thinks they're answerable, but she is looking for empirical proof, uh, looking for molecules. And I coin a new term. Metacules. Uh, so she's looking for uh, molecules. So I said, it's not to be found in molecules, it's found to be in metacules. Right? This idea that there's something more. So they go on and talk about serotonin and LSD. They were discovered together as profound impact because of how little caused a giant effect. Here's where it gets interesting. So here's what serotonin is doing and what LSD does. And this is what makes this more interesting. So they talk about serotonin and LSD. So she talks about how LSD binds the H2A um, serotonin receptor and mentions there's 14 subtypes of serotonin receptors. Now, she gla glazed over this a little bit, mentioning the HT2A. That's not 100% true. Like, you can have a psychedelic influenced experience by not influenced the HT2A, what we're talking about is one of these profound experiences. That's what one of these HT2A
influenced experiences are. It's a much more profound. So it's after a certain threshold dose. You can go back and listen to some of my other podcasts where I discuss this. And so they're talking about how LSD works. And I'll make it simpler than what the podcast uh, explains. I believe the term is ligand. I mentioned it in the other podcast. But it's essentially a doorstop left open in our serotonin receptors. So we are flooded. Not flooded, I guess, is the right term, but it's, as she says, it's longer lasting. And I do ask if Green was right about it being weaker bonds uh, naturally, whereas a stronger bond, but we'll talk about that another time. Then we go on and talk about the doors of perception. Aldous Huxley, that is very important. Are we designed to take these chemicals is my question. I think it, we are. But it's not so much that we're designed in that sense, but we've developed into who we are because of our affinity, our affinity for these compounds. So that's the way, do we keep them around out of affinity, right? Do we continue to have an affinity for these compounds because of the affinity the compounds have for us, both our state and our, um, I guess, our evolution in a sense. They go on to talk about, and I love this quote, the not-self in the not-self that was the chair. That's a quote from uh, The Doors of Perception. Right? So I'm going to mention here the page over where Rick Dobbin now is, again, talking about Aldous Huxley and how he didn't really like the idea of only intellectuals can benefit. Or any set of special value for intellectuals. Right? He worked with Stan Groff, an early LSD researcher, who developed, like I said, that holotropic breathing technique to replace LSD, which is kind of a major insight in and of itself. And he talked about how, and he misunderstood. So what I was talking about is Rick Dobbin misunderstood what Aldous Huxley meant by this special import to intellectuals. What Aldous Huxley meant is it could teach philosophers and the religious, these poindectors, it could teach them how to change their perspective, have a better understanding what Carl Jung was getting at with active imagination, that you had to leave your reason behind to make sense of the, the sense and the nonsense, right? To, to open your doors of perception, right? So he mentioned that uh, these Skid Row gentlemen had these same profound experiences, but they didn't have the words to explain it. And I've explained that before. That's why so many people put it into context of a religious experience, because that's the context they understand, right? Does it reveal our outer world was a, qu a question, right? And then Gull mentioned noetics. What is real, really, really real, uh, as it relates to the Good Friday experiment? Same idea. It's if your context is theological, your understanding of uh, a, an altered state will be theological, right? Uh, she goes on and talks about how we perceive and that the, maybe the thalamus gland is this reducing valve that takes the entirety of reality and reduces it down into um, a palatable, um, I love that, palatable uh, state, something we can consume, we can, we can understand, we can infer. Because they go on and talk about how um, these doors are opened up to new knowledge. But they talk about the priors. And I find that funny because, again, they're trapped in the empirical. Because they say it opens up these doors to new knowledge. So Gull, the scientist, the neuroscientist, thinks that maybe this, this data, uh, we're, we're allowed to a greater access to this data. But never once do they mention, maybe it's not just the prior data, we have greater access to the prior data. But maybe we have access to, and they've mentioned William James at least twice in, in a less than two-hour podcast, yet they don't understand, as Jung understood, maybe there's something more, um, an external consciousness that we can tap into, as, as William uh, James was talking about. I say that maybe psychedelic uh, takes off the limiters, right? It unlimits the brain, thus making it that supercomputer I've mentioned before. This idea that the human brain is among the greatest parser, 
of knowledge, potential parser of knowledge in the world. So what we consider induction, right, the, the open problem of induction in philosophy, what we consider something we pull down from the ether is actually um, kind of like a, a NASA scientist doing math for a grade three kid, right? You can show this kid all you want, but it's still going to seem like wizardry or gobbledygook, depending on how he sees it. So Gogol goes on and talks about the psychedelic experience versus hallucination. That's why, and she mentions my buddy, Shogun, right? Uh, talking about altered states of consciousness. So that's why I would love that they would understand entheogens. They talked about classical psychedelics or serotonin psychedelics. Why not entheogens? I don't understand why they don't understand that particular term. Uh, but she talks about this opening of perception, this change of priors. And she gives an example of how water in pictures will move or tend to move for somebody on psychedelics. Or a group of priests will see God. But what I don't understand is she doesn't explain how this change of state can influence our perceived prior laws. That a picture of a... Of a of a waterfall is static versus being able to look like it's flowing. I mean, look at a painting. We're actually playing with that perception in a painting. Why can't a picture play with that perception? We're seeing it now with so many of these fantastic sort of looking uh, mixed media type uh, art um, installations that will actually play on that same... Um, what would you call it, uh, prior perceived um, potential, right? So you look at a picture, shouldn't move, right? That's what gets changed. So the, uh, I actually mentioned that that shows her faithlessness, uh, that she doesn't understand how the doors of perception can actually open up. It's not just a God sort of thing. It's possible that it can access more uh, than we have faith in. Right? As I said before, it's possible that the brain is just the greatest supercomputer ever conceived from our perspective. We just don't have faith in it, uh, in what it can achieve, what it can, it can produce. So they go on to talk about sentence setting. I've mentioned this before, how important uh, intuition is, or intention, my apologies, intention is to the sentence set setting. They seem uh, to assume that's part of set and setting. Uh, what's a bad experience? Uh, I argue that a bad experience is essentially nothing but set and setting. And, or a lack of education, or sometimes it can be contamination on mushrooms, I've seen that. But Reggie talks about safe, safety, right? He's talking about not having like a doomer attitude, right? I've seen that so often, I guess that's what he's talking about. You have these people coming into it expecting to have a bad trip, well... You're creating your reality there. Reggie goes on to talk about a really cringy K-hole experience he had in a bar. Um, he goes on to understand my theory of these experiences uh, teach us uh, how to learn, right? It's tracking how we manage these experiences, right? Like dyslexia, more noise. You have a choice of either shutting off or parsing more data. If, as a dyslexic, that experience is constant and ceaseless, well, you only have one choice. <laughs> I guess. It depends. <laughs> but when it comes to psychedelics, repeated exposure to it allows you to make those choices. Obviously, repeated exposure. You're unlikely to shut off all the time. So, anyways. He goes on to talk about ket ketamine and an experience of DXM, uh, dextromethorphan. That was a common um, uh, disassociative uh, I argue he might have read too much blue light or arrowids uh, when he was growing up. But dextromethorphan is not as much fun as you might think. Um, it's uh, disassociative. And what that means is it makes you kind of slow and if you feel like you're outside of your experience. And it's not terribly much fun, really. And, and that's where that syrup, the syrup uh, with the opiates, were doing. Um, sadly, it was a golden age a long time ago. But then they go on and talk about the default mode network. The default mode network. They believe it to be the source of the center of self. Self. The center 
of the sense of self, the default mode network. So I call that entheogens. Entheogens turn this up or down. You get more unfiltered info. Rick Dobbin goes on and talks about, um, what did he talk about? Uh, no. I'm just saying that maybe that's what he was mentioning. But I made a note here that he needs to understand that there's this idea of a ego recontextualization. Uh, like dyslexia, it allows you to see more uh, as opposed to dyslexia, forcing you to see more. So it's a change of perception is what I made a note there. They go on and Doblin talks about his PTSD research, MDMA. Uh, he had a, a victim of trauma. Uh, he says it's about trust. He saw uh, trauma on top of the realities. So in this psychedelic-assisted therapy that's allowed us to see how trauma informs our everyday experience, what I call trauma-informed adaptations. So this young lady who was taking MDMA-assisted therapy, she was able to um, re-experience her trauma. I consider this narrative theory, which leads to healing. She was... Um, seeing how there was this trauma-informed overlay on top of her experience of reality. And by stripping that away, recontextualizing the experience uh, through narrative theory, she was able to reduce the impact that trauma had on her day-to-day -day life. Right? Uh, your prior... Yes, yeah, so that's what... Um, uh, Rick Dobbins calls it. He calls it your prior changes the overlay. That's just, I think, because he doesn't want to say trauma, right? So your previous experience has caused some sort of uh, adaptive change that has caused, uh, what would you call it? Um, a negative uh, reaction uh, and a resultant, uh, what would you call it? Uh, um, tendency to react in a similar way. So this allows you to change this trauma-informed adaptation or what he calls changing this overlay that resulted from their prior. So again, narrative theory, recontextualization of the experience, the prior, the trauma, whatever you want to call it, allows one to move forward without that impingement, without that influence of previous um, uh, maladaptive uh, influence. So he says you're healed by changing your relationship with your past, with your trauma, with your experience. At this point, I'm not sure what's me and what's the video, but it doesn't matter. Hopefully, it helps uh, deepen our understanding of both. So he's talking about our object for... No, no, that was me. Uh, actually, they make reference of our object versus our perception of the object. That's my theory that trauma is a term we use for the experience that results in, an, in an, uh, a maladaptive um, uh, result in behavior. What I mean by that is there is this idea of trauma is just an experience. But if you can have two people experience the exact same trauma, but one walk away unchanged and the other completely changed, that means that the trauma is actually the resultant um, change, more so the perception and then the how it's integrated by the person. So it's how they're influenced by the experience, not the experience themselves. It's how they perceive it and then the resultant narrative theory. And it can be healed by the same narrative theory. So it's really part of uh, philosophy, this idea that object versus our perception of the object. Right. So Doblin's mention, uh, he mentions it without the philosophy base of this idea that there's two separate uh, ideas. There's the idea of the object that we perceive and our perception of the object. They're two separate things. So Reggie goes on and talks about the flow in creation. Uh, he's getting into the flow, the Tao of, the harmony, the balance, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he talks about being out of time. Uh, and I like this idea of being outside of time like a being outside of time, or being out of time, like a being outside of time. I like this idea that 
you are a being outside of time because you can be a timeless being because when we talk about I've talked about it in another podcast this idea of when time flies right so our per- perception of time is contextual right because when you're being mindful time moves slowly that shows that we are a being outside of time so the podcast goes on they talk about higher self versus lower self this uh, paradox of comparison right so what is self and that's funny because that's exactly what Jung's talking about because we play around with all of these personas then there's the uh, unified self and there's the individual separate from the unity and so we try to cobble together this idea of self but we pick and choose what aspects we're going to combine therefore we fail the instruction is we can't ignore the good and the bad because they all make up the context that is the complete self so they go on, go on and talk about time uh, duality uh, experiences in Describable. It's funny, the duality of non duality, right? Because our experience is individual yet universal. It's so hard to explain. I mean, I love that idea. I've, I've mentioned Emerson, his idea that uh, experience is universal, it's the storyteller and their, you know, gift of gab, as it were, that makes them different. So they go on and talk about psychedelics versus psychotropics. I say, it's called entheogens, people. Let's use the term. <laughs> they say, self-looking at other selves. That was Reggie Watts. I like that, right? Uh, and I mention it because it's the Isha Upanishads, the sixth sutra, which is being able to see the self in others and the others in self. That's the true nature of harmony, of balance, of understanding reality. Reggie goes on and talks about extra time. He describes, as he describes, that synchronicity, this flow state, right? This state of the Tao, effortless being. And Gould says that uh, she has a new theory, not the default um, mode network, but she says, as the brain matures, it is plastic, it absorbs experience. These critical periods, right? Uh, Conrad Lorenz, uh, snow geese, This forming of an attachment for life happens in the first 48 hours. That's the critical period. After 48 hours, the geese don't develop this critical bond. So she says that we have these critical periods. Can we reopen these? So she says for language, for motor learning, for vision, for sensory perception, even social uh, context and... and, um, and experience and interaction has a critical period. So she says, can we correct these areas? Can we reopen these critical periods? Right? And again, I think she has too much faith in science. By, And you can listen to exactly how she explains this, but she seems to be too... too... too certain that she's going to be able to prove everything empirically. Uh, she talks about how um, the mouth uh, proved the social learning um, critical period. So we go on and we're talking about set and setting again and how it works uh, and, and how our animal studies uh, show how this stuff works. I, I mentioned this before that it's intention uh, and set and setting. Um, we go on and talk about dosage tests in mice. Uh, They say that people are similar. Did they get lasting results? So uh, they go on to talk about people have a period of contextualization, then integration. Uh, She didn't mention that, right? So she talks about the lasting results. But this idea is not just going into this period. When I say set and setting, that applies to just the experience. This is why I say intention is completely separate. Because intention goes on beyond that initial sitting and the experience of the psychedelic uh, therapy itself. Intention goes on to encompass this lasting results. I say it's people have a period of contextualization, then integration. So you have the experience, tends to be wordless for many. Then there's the contextualization. So you have to take time to integrate it to the self and understand it, yada, yada, yada. Then you can integrate it. They didn't mention this. 
they go on and they talk about uh, discovered the MDMA. Can it reopen the critical period and have a lasting effect? So quote I have here, effects as context dependent, right? Alone, um, no social. Uh, so alone, the study showed that there is no social um, context improvement, but with the, uh, the treatment, uh, with social interaction, they had social benefit. And what I mentioned is she mentions that anything is a challenge if we're open to solving it, right? So the reason why the mice didn't improve socially is because they weren't challenged socially. And they talk about how can your uh, talent for piano be improved, right, by opening the critical period. And they go, yes, yes, yes. I argue what it could do is if you're already talented in that area, you have some talent, uh, you've learned some piano, it can actually make you... Uh, develop it more, but I think learning has proved where this mostly is coming from. Is uh, and this is my dyslexia and the uh, the spectrum argument comes in that the the psychedelic uh, assisted learning period is actually aided more by the focus that is aided by psychedelics, but not the actual learning process. So the learning process is made manifest by our ability to focus. We've talked about this, that mindfulness is the true gauge to how well you can learn something and retain it. So I argue we're not understanding. This is like a three-body problem here. But they say yes and no, and this is what gets into this idea of there might be some dangers to psychedelic-assisted therapy. He says, uh, MDMA is not alone. Um, so he says there's an acute phase. Uh, okay, so I think they reference this idea that you need to take it beyond a certain threshold dose. Uh, and I'd say they were right about this idea of working past the challenge, uh, which kind of works into this idea that uh, it also is dependent on dose. Because if you don't take enough, you're not challenged enough, and you don't come out changed. But again, a lot of science still needs to be uh, developed in this area. I mentioned I should probably email her about this idea, right? Oh, okay, no, that's what it was. This note is that uh, I was right about dyslexia can be uh, fixed. So um, she mentioned this idea that maybe we can learn to heal just about anything. I say we can go one step further. Does this prove uh, both the theory and maybe show the possible therapeutic uh, protocol or avenue for which we can heal learning disabilities or developmental disabilities because she mentioned this when it came to these critical periods for reading because it coincides with the theory that a lot of disabilities are actually just um, social um, issues that happen at the time of these critical periods for learning blah 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 but what's funny is it's not even critical periods when it comes to reading uh, because I think learning uh, at an older age is foundational uh, not um, transformational because you see that we think kids learn best at this period or that period but that's just because we've chosen to teach them at this period or that period or this period so there's a lot to learn in this area but I think she could do well to understand that uh, she's not alone in this theory that maybe we could relearn uh, in areas that we thought we were deficient in but we were not actually deficient uh, it just um, we had other things that were impinging our learning. So therapeutic outcomes, uh, narrative recontextualization, uh, like the self, right? So I argue uh, there is avenue for recontextualization outside of just an understanding of the self, understanding of our, uh, our relationship to others, uh, maybe understanding of others itself. Uh, they go on to talk about um, psychedelics being connected to the self, uh, a perceptual self, a complete self that is gestalt, like Jung's idea of the self. Uh, Jung was talking about this idea that um, we're disconnected from who we truly are because we think we are ourselves, when in reality, uh, 
we're we're just this um, it's it's related to Nietzsche's oh hold on here well, my apologies. Uh, it's uh, a one-hour limit on this here, so we just paused it up. But as the video carries on, Reggie talks about uh, taking a mushroom just from a park. And a single mushroom, I, I got news for you, because mushrooms are 90 plus percent water. Um, yeah, it wouldn't have been much of an experience, but he talks about tripping his balls out in the bathroom, right, where he met his self. That's uh, this idea of individuation with Jung, but, you know, to each his own. That was a weird, uh, another cringy trip experience. But So they've gone on and talk about uh, dualist versus a non-dualist world uh, view. Is it one experience? I mean, we talked about this earlier. Is it contextual? So he says perception. Reggie mentions perception. Context, bias, this relates to the bad trip idea, right? And then we mentioned Sasha Shogun again. Uh, uh, divine a new drug is what he would do. I use that myself, divine a new drug. Then 12 would try it. And then they'd all have a different experience and they'd compare it. And then the median experience would help decide if there was healing benefit, potential. And, well, according to them, they'd release it. But I think he was mostly doing the research. And then uh, Rick Dobbin says something's a little questionable. Uh, he says, uh, are we bad at our core? And he, he seems to reference without Christianity, but, but to the drugs, can they heal this bad to our core? I'm just wondering what this statement was. It was a little obscure. He studies MDMA trials uh, with this take. Is he tired? Is it ego depletion? Um, a two mind system, a two thinking. So I wonder where this comes from. Uh, I'll have to. Well, hold on here. Let me just re review it. Well, I listened to it a couple more times, and it, it does seem like he was just getting at the idea that um, entheogens don't naturally cure racism and what is ailing society because he says as example or some of these churches these ayahuasca churches that have come to america from south america they're still misogynist and racist and all this other stuff so i don't know where he was going with that um just a weird example i don't think he was uh, saying they're all uh, guilty of this same idea um so we'll go on uh the the next interesting section is a police officer who's also um, uh, a psychologist, which is interesting. So he talks about that we have a mental health crisis, full stop. But then he goes on and talks about the PTSD in first responders and how much of a crisis it is. I argue like vets, he's showing the needing for training, the need for training first, not just uh, healing after, but... We came up with this term called the psychedelic phenomenology of self. The us versus them idea. And this is what he keeps going into because policing involves a lot of fear, the officer and the, uh, the, you know, the use of intimidation. He says it just by nature uh, of, well, the job. It causes this them and us. It causes this... Uh, uh, trauma and uh, so that's what this universal truth that I talk about this idea of upeka upeksha um, the uh, equanimity right it says the cop says we need to see uh, us as them right that's why I talk about uh, my pronouns being we and us right like young so he's getting at this idea of seeing yourself in others and seeing others in yourself. And that's what Jung was talking about. Once you learn to diagnose, you can't help but to diagnose everyone you see. So he, And I would uh, highlight uh, what um, proof of uh, gestalt of healing is in this segment here because um, 
I mentioned very right, clear minds when they're not stressed, right? It allows, because he also talks about, you know, eating right and sleeping right, but also meditation and, and a clear mind and not being overly stressed. Uh, so the gestalt of healing, right? The mind and body being uh, a combination. And so I go on and mention that only uh, therapist assisted uh, is as uh, diminishing uh, oh no, that was mentioned here. What did I say? Hold on. Yeah, so I was just reiterating my uh, theory that um, therapist-assisted uh, treatment uh, therapy is um, diminishing, as diminishing as, uh, or as example from Rick uh, Doblin's uh, understanding of what uh, Huxley was getting at. So what I mean is, if you can only access this healing protocol through a therapist, well, how many people are going to have access to it? So it's the same idea that uh, Rick misunderstood. Huxley, I don't believe, was saying that it's only for the intellectual. What he was saying is it would be particularly beneficial for the intellectuals because they're the ones that are exploring this territory, so they'd be the ones most likely to benefit from it. So here's the same idea that if we only allowed... This, these therapies to be uh, accessed through, um, you know, certain channels that's going to limit how many people can access it, right? So, uh, and I, <laughs> so I make a joke, and in, in, in how is a goony uh, or a goofy therapist uh, uh, going to uh, uh, right guide us? As Jung said, it, it takes... Uh, takes 20 years for these protocols to make its way to the public, uh, right? Or, I argue, is this um, a way to slow this down? Because, once again, just like the religious idea, if we allow people access to a protocol that would eliminate therapy, or at least significantly minimize the need, is that something that there'd be some some reason to put a little wrench in the works here, right? But So that's what I was getting at, right? Is how is a goofy therapist going to guide men is what I was getting at. Just, you know, just a little joke that uh, so many of these um, psychedelic practitioners have never taken, taken it, right? And if they have, they've taken it once and they've taken it under the guidance of a... So they've just had what we would call like a a sterile experience, right? It's really quite sad, but it goes on. Um, and I mentioned William James' Six Souls, right? Uh, recently, I got uh, two perfect hexagrams that followed the premiere of this particular video about psychedelics uh, and creativity, because if you're listening to my podcast, that's what I've been all about, this creativity and as I've mentioned psychedelics can offer this same change of state but it's not the only way um, but this still uh, I'm still not a believer because as I said uh, Carl Jung's happy fiction is fiction right but this is where I get back to this idea of trust is the true heart of this teaching trust not belief or absolute faith right? Us versus them is mentioned. They go on and talk about the drug war, uh, empathy for police. Uh, he mentions uh, about how difficult this is when you call it a war. I highlight how the, uh, the, uh, the, the Nazis, uh, the Nazis uh, highlighted this problem uh, during World War II, that it was tough to militarize, I mean, tough to police uh, people with a militarized force. So this is the same idea, right? When when you're not part of the community, it's difficult to, you know, police the, right? Which is help the system to function. Right? To go on and I mentioned trauma, uh, heal it by preventing it, right? Uh, I could mention personal anecdotal experience uh, galore, but I'll go on from here. Psychedelics to do with your make your job better. Um, I think the example I've already given. Uh, make your job better. The example I gave was um, 
being able over to overcome learning disability uh, naturally, or uh, my ability to be able to play uh, video games on uh, psychedelics actually make me better player, not worse. Whereas, as I've said, other people can't even perceive it because I think it's just not pushing past that barrier because I've seen it myself. I'll take a very strong dose of psychedelics and I will look at a computer screen and I just can't get into it because I can tell how fake it is. It highlights how fake it is that it's just a panel displaying little colored lights and it takes me an incredible amount of like energy to buy into the fakeness of what it is and to be able to actually what would you call it um, commune with this this uh, it's uh, it's a fake uh, version of the real thing but neither here nor there but what I've talked about, I think I've mentioned it. If not, I'll mention it quickly. This idea that um, because of the slowness of my computer and the lag, um, closeness to servers, we tested all of this. Um, and of course, my buddy, just having spent the last 20 years playing video games and I didn't, he would kick my butt. But on mushrooms, I would run circles around it and kick his butt. And like I said, it wasn't him letting me win because, oh, you're on mushrooms. He was really shocked. He's like, I can't believe you can even play, let alone... F he would get mad, like mad when I kick his butt. Because I was excited. He took it as, you know, being a, a jerk about, you know what I mean? He's like, yeah, you're all chuffed. I was just shocked, and, and it was so much fun uh, playing video games on, uh, on mushrooms. And he took it wrong. So like I said, I take from that that he wasn't letting me win and how shocked he was that I was able to do it all together is this proof that... Yes, psychedelics can improve this stuff. I've talked about this um, proof we've seen with the people in Silicon Valley, right? They use uh, was it magnetic resonance uh, to show how the brain lights up under psychedelics, right? Becomes more productive, more creative, right? That's why I thought it was so profound, so synergistic, so kismet that this video would high, uh, would premiere right at the exact same time when I'm working on this particular different stuff, right? Uh, so that was the question asked for the host. Can they help you do your job better? Absolutely. Uh, like artists uh, who see uh, their art uh, improve with psychedelics, I argue that almost anything would improve, and I've just explained that, right? Reggie says, um, it's a trial by fire. Uh, he said, but like for all of us, I argue not just for the police, but for all of us, uh, these psychedelics are exactly what I explained earlier. Uh, the fact that it challenges us makes us work harder than normal. It's like working a muscle. And so Reggie goes on and talks about need for more training, more tools, uh, anything that requires split second uh, choices requires focus and training to slow down time to make better decisions. And that's what I argue, as Jung would say, as Nietzsche would say, as Buddhism, Vedanta, you name it, um, would say that uh, you, you have to manage your emotional regulation to be present, to be focused, to be aware. That slows down time. I talked about this earlier, this dilation of time, that, right, ooh, uh, time flies. This idea that if time can fly, time can, fly, time can slow down as well. So the video goes on and Gould mentions uh, that it's not a silver bullet, right? This is important to understand. Just like we talked about earlier, uh, activating the HT2A uh, serotonin receptor seems to give you access to this heating, healing protocol with psychedelics. But if you only activate the HT1A, uh, it can cause some issues. It can heighten anxiety. It can heighten depression. It can make your symptoms worse. Uh, but she proceeds to explain how trauma... Uh, psychedelic therapy can uh, risk the worsening of symptoms, which is not wrong at all. Talks about, uh, uh, I mentioned the one serotonin versus the two, so I just mentioned that. Uh, again, I want to reiterate this doorstop and perception. Uh, ooh, that's cool, yes, because if you put a doorstop in just the HD1A, that seems to be the anxiety and the depression um, receptor. So that just heightens it. But if you put a doorstop in the HD1A and HD2A, uh, 
that seems to contextualize things for some odd reasons. But if you think about it, it makes perfect sense because as soon as you apply narrative theory to your trauma, your experience, your whatever they called it again, your past, what did they call it? Um, Neither here nor there. So they proceed to go, uh, and I argue, uh, LSD leaves the God window open. A doorstop in perception. This idea that when they did the Friday, the Good Friday experiments, that right, someone who's religious will experience psychedelics in a religious context. Um, someone who takes it outside of that context, he's still going to have these profound experience, but it's up to him how he integrates it, right? And how he contextualizes it. And that's what this is showing here, right? And they proceed to go on. The question is, could we regress as far as laws and our perception when it comes to it? And he says, absolutely. He proceeds to go on and talk about how democracy is at risk and perfect example how it's synchronicity, right? Because you can go back to... Uh, when I was young 30 years ago, or even my parents when they were young, uh, we, we are always seemingly in, um, in, in entropy. And, and I think that's our natural state. But when you're right in the middle of it, and I argue about that, right? When you are at the center of the system, it's near impossible to see uh, the, the functioning and the operation of the system. So how can you... Um, what would you call that? Uh, how can you? Uh, uh, well, how can you test and improve the system if you're in the system? And I argue that's what you can see if you're in one of these echo chambers and don't see that what we're in today isn't that different when, than what they were in years ago. That's when you lose this message of the universality of many of these experiences, right? Because the main uh, quotient is the person, right? And so they go on and talk about public education is key. And there you go, right? You have to educate the individual to be an agent, an agent for change, an agent for action. I've said this before. If you look at the characters for human being uh, in uh, the East, it speaks to the person being present on the field of action, ready to take action. So that's two separate things. Being in the right place at the right time, but also being prepared to take action, right? And they proceed to go on and um, uh, ignorance. Uh, Rita, he seems to have a, a right versus left view of this. Um, so I think he was referring to the idea of the importance of critical thinking. Uh, he talked about more challenges, uh, anxiety, the mental health, the depression. Um, he needs to reform drug policy. Uh, he really does think that's caused a, a major harm. Uh, but he does think that, um, I do believe he believes a therapist should be the gatekeeper. Not that dissimilar from, I mean, really the biggest problem when it came to religion as well. Then Gould uh, wanted to know about consciousness. Why she got into her field. That's why she got into her field. My apology. Uh, why did she get into her field? Gould got into her field because she wanted to know about Consciousness, same as me, right? The phenomenology of the self. Uh, she goes on, um, she has some data that's not been uh, published yet uh, about mystical experiences, like sensory deprivation in retreats or what can be done through holotropic uh, breathing. I argue sweat lodges. She says that they were able to achieve social deprivation in mice which showed an ability to reopen the critical period. She talks about possibly the visual deprivation, the sensory deprivation is my question. So I argue deprivation period. I mean, it makes uh, the joke I've made before about uh, Goggins, the, uh, the philosophy of Goggins boiled down to you're either growing or you're atrophying. That's deprivation, right? I mean, the duality 
of the non-duality of deprivation, right? I mean, deprivation in itself from the Yi Jing speaks to it's not what we think of in the West. Deprivation isn't a complete and other uh, absence. Uh, it, think of it more like the lack of appreciation because when it comes to deprivation in the, the West, you would think, well, you have nothing. And in the East, it it's the idea that you have everything you need, so all you need to do is appreciate what you have. And you can turn deprivation into, um, you know, already fulfilled or, or um, you know, uh, uh, approaching, you know, something, that sort of idea, right? You move more towards the center, away from the outside. And he says, um, the deprivation sets up this critical window to reopen right? this uh, this idea of of like the, the psyche and the brain I argue that we can do that ourselves I, I mentioned it earlier that I think because we train ourselves to think oh you learn languages when you're young and yada 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 you know what I mean I'm just giving examples because we've been programmed to believe this narrative then we don't think outside of the narrative. It's what I've mentioned before, that when you're told that you have a disability in this particular area, well, then you don't try to improve your skills in that area because, oh, well, I have a dysfunction in that area because I have a dis-ease, so I feel, uh, I don't feel at ease when I work with that. So, wait a minute, that kind of relates. Wait a minute, if I have a disability in an area, that means that I don't have proficiency. If I improve my proficiency, I reduce my dis-ease and my disability. Funny how that works, right? Mindfulness, being aware, being present, willing to take action, to make change, right? So I argue dopamine deprivation. Could this be the exception, right? Could this make it worse, this idea that dopamine deprivation to open a critical window. But since I made my notes on first pass, and that was yesterday, I've been able to give that some thought. And if you look at um, the joke that I've made before that um, you'll have nothing and, and you'll be happy, well, that's the solution for people that have very low levels of dopamine or serotonin receptors because you can't really rebuild, you know, you can't give them a medication. And s recent science shows maybe that even our attempt to use a uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor was a failure, that you can't, you can't help that. The only thing you can do is have the patient appreciate what they do have. I mean, I think it goes back to Seneca, maybe even earlier, but the idea of if you don't have what you want, you should, ha you should want what you have. That's the secret. So this dopamine deprivation works in a very similar way. And, and arguably, science is even pointing to our ability to regenerate. But we won't go into that. We're on the podcast here. And so as a final thought, oof, we are just about done here. As a final thought, the host... Uh, uh, had the one psychedelic experience uh, which he um, may have given himself, right? Because he, he said he'd had to ask his wife if he did smoke. Did I smoke? I think I smoked. And I mean, I had that experience myself. But unlike in Amsterdam, my experience with very strong hash, it very well could have been, uh, could have been laced with something. But I had a very, very psychedelic experience on hash. But it was a combination of set and setting, which is what he probably did. He worked himself up into a frenzy, as I've seen many people do. But for me, it was some uh, hash, very strong, high-quality hash uh, with some blades. I had it all set up, some hot knives, as it's called, uh, all set up. Uh, I actually pushed the dose that day because of what I was doing um, since I had to take uh, a bus. I had to take a city bus to school in the morning for uh, high school. I was take I was in a French immersion, so I had to take a, uh, I had to go to a school that was out of my area, so they didn't bust me there. I had to find my own way, which wasn't bad, let's be honest. 
Uh, but they could have at least paid for my bus pass. I mean, come on, but neither here nor there. Um, I was taking uh, high doses of this uh, hashish. I had a buddy uh, who used to get it from a biker uh, as a favor for his daughter. Uh, long story. It's a cool story, but we won't get into that. My really good buddy, Mark, uh, God rest his soul. Um, he used to uh, get this, and he, he didn't really enjoy it because uh, only edibles, uh, any other form of uh, cannabis would make him very, very ill. It gave him a very bad trip. I think he was allergic. I've heard of this. I'm not familiar. But I used to get this really high-quality hash. So actually, because it was so high-quality, I was able to actually start using it as an entheogen. And so I was starting to use it every day. So I had an opportunity in the morning because I had such a long commute on the bus. I would take uh, high doses of uh, this hashish uh, in a very clean way. I just take the hash on some hot knives uh, so there's no tobacco, there's no uh, nothing, no barriers to me taking very, very high doses. Um, I was not uh, new. I'd been probably smoking hash for uh, many years at that point. And so this particular morning that I had this major psychedelic experience, um, I, I'd actually started building upon it. So just to give you an example, this is hopefully a less cringy version of a uh, psychedelic trip experience. So I uh, got up in the morning. Um, I was young, still in high school. Um, so I'd actually moved home with my mother. My mother was living in a townhouse at the time. Uh, so we were sharing the place. I lived in the basement. She lived uh, in the top two floors. So uh, when it came to the morning, I actually got up in the morning, still going to high school. Uh, but working, that's right. So I had to get up in the morning and do some shit, go to school, and then I'd have to get to my job, right? So responsibilities, man, it sucked. So what I'd do is I'd get up in the morning with uh, with uh, my mayor, get uh, a bunch of shit done and help her with her crap, and I'd see her off to work, right? And she knew, you know, but she didn't know to what extent I was using, but she knew. So I'd see her off to work, and then what I'd do is I'd set up the stove. I'd put the uh, the hot knives, the blades in the stove to heat up. Uh, you'd want to heat them up pretty hot because uh, you'd want to vaporize this hashish. Now I know you didn't. You probably shouldn't have heated it up too hot, but you know what I mean. We, we were just learning at the time. So you heat up the knives, and you're vaporizing just the hashish itself. So this is, at the time, as close as you could get. Um, next to honey oil, it's as close as you can get to the pure, uh, you know, unadulterated uh, product, uh, the, the cannabinoids, right? All of the calyxes, cali, calyx, who knows? English is weird with uh, the plurals. So this one morning, um, I had uh, added some to my protocol, so I wouldn't just take a bunch of hits of hash, and then, you know, whatever, listen to some music and, and uh, jump on the bus. Uh, now I thought, let's really, really see what we can do. And what I found is I could carry um, a, the psychedelic experience into everyday life. So I would uh, take a half dozen or more um, uh, balls of, of hashish in blades, and then I'd go over to the stereo where I'd set up the speakers. So, And my buddy gave me this idea. He used to try this. And it was just a newbie by accident. He said, oh, I was so trippy. I went home and I put the speakers between my head and I tripped out. So I tried it. So I put the speakers, one on either side of my head. And I put on uh, Jimi Hendrix's Electric Ladyland. Uh, and so this is, what, 30 years ago? Uh, I apologize for uh, busting myself it's more than 30 years ago on my age. Um, but that's the golden age. Uh, it was a second golden age of psychedelics, I would say, uh, at this particular time, and, and even better. We'll talk about another time, what's called research chemicals. But this is about hashish. So I was able to dose very heavily with this hashish, where like, woo, you're really, really, really dosed. And so I'd set up between these um, two speakers. And if you've listened to Eddie Murphy's Electric Ladyland, you understand. If you haven't, go out and listen. Because it sounds like an alien spaceship is taking off and landing. So it takes off and it flies around and lands. And then the entire album is meant to be kind of an experience, right? Have you ever been?
Have you ever been to Electric Lady Land? And I understand now, after how many decades, that this is no different, right? That Electric Lady Land, it's Shakti in the Indian, or Dakini in um, uh, Tibetan. Jung called it um, uh, Salome. Um, I mean, you can name it, right? This, this archetype of the mother, right? But beyond the self, in communion with the other, right? This mother goddess just embodies the archetype of the archetype, right? There's because we can't perceive the, the thing ourselves. So this archetype of the mother embodies what is the truth of, it seems, the truth of a universal collective unconscious that ties us all together, whatever it might be. And because of our limited finite minds, it's how we see and how we perceive these things. So for me, from a very early age, it began. And just to further this trip report, what I was able to do was begin this out-of-body experience by listening to this album. And what I was able to do is I was able to carry this essentially psychedelic experience into my everyday life. And I was able to go out and take the bus to school, still tripping, right, listening. I love that I had portable media. This was uh, early when we had the little cassette players, um, the portable cassette players. So I was able to really enjoy um, the experience of a change of state, not temporary but extended, and even more so, just like I, um, I extol the benefits of not just meditating on a cushion, but taking that to your everyday life, I was able to experience everyday life under the influence of, I would say psychedelia, but arguably it's what, uh, what the gentleman said, whether it was William James or Aldous Huxley, matters not. The thin veil torn away between these consciousnesses. I was able to experience both, which is arguably the practice of uh, vivid, uh, what do they call it, lucid dreaming, right? Being able to experience that, that transition between the awake and the sleep, right? But anyways, there's your freaky trip report for you. I hope I covered it all. But anyways, they talked about, uh, so this is what I wrote here, right? Um, I said, first experiences are never the most memorable. If you do it more than a few times, an insight, an insightful trip is a skill. That's when you get insight. Right? Uh, insightful trip is a skill that must be practiced. In Sanskrit, upaya. Right? This is, um, what do you call it? Um, efficient means or skillful means. So when it comes... I mentioned it earlier, Reggie, Reggie uh, Watts. When, when someone talks about the come on or the come down, you know they've done, the, they've, they've done psychedelics more than once um, because these are aspects that you're only able to appreciate because, again, we talked about it before, you're not as stressed, so you're able to focus more on the experience in the moment, in the present. Um, but that's about it. I guess that's, um, that was the entirety of the... Uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the video. Um, I took a little break because I noticed uh, Daniel Ingram did a podcast with Guru Viking, um, and he talked about casino practice, where um, he doesn't make them completely give up all social media. He allows them to fart around with their phones. I just thought to make a suggestion that, hey, he could use to implement goals, uh, um, recent uh, insights about social contact, social, uh, this critical um, period. So he could look at, um, you know, you can talk to family and friends, but, you know, I mean, no Facebook, no Instagram, that sort of crap, right? When you're practicing at a retreat, I think that was the initial intent, right? It's actually allowing you to experience that change of state when you're no longer connected to all of your electronic devices. You're able to connect with yourself. And if you're able to connect with yourself, not distracted, as I've said before, Marshall McLuhan, uh, 
had this theory that you externalize the self when it comes to all this media. And I posit that we're in a position now where we're unable to recollect ourselves. So that's why Jung was saying that we need to stop and maybe pay attention. What was that saying? Um, uh, tune in, tune out. Drop in, tune in, drop in. But this idea that you need to stop externalizing yourself to get to the point where you can look internally to understand what is the nature of self. And in so doing, believe it or not, you find a connection. The duality of non-duality. Uh, Jung calls it the, the conflict of the opposites or the unity of the opposites. When I, I really can't say it any more clearly than that, this idea that know thyself, and in so doing, you change everything. If you want to change the universe, change yourself.